the first uh, thing I want to say is I should introduce myself. I always fail to do that. I'm Mike Faber. I'm director of the Older Learner Center at Grand Rapids Community College. We're celebrating this year our 15th anniversary year. And this event is part of our birthday celebration. So thank you for coming to our birthday party. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. <laughs> Secondly, I have had two committees that have been working tirelessly over the last year to put this together. And they include our Senior Leadership Grand Rapids Advisory Council and the West Michigan Encore Careers Committee. So I'd ask members of those two committees to please stand and be recognized, and I know also our registration folks are out there too. Please stand and be recognized. <laughs> These are volunteers that today would not be a reality without their help. They've rolled up their sleeves, they care about the issues, they care about our community, and they care about you. And that's why today is what it is. We also have to recognize all of our sponsors, because financially, putting on an event like this is not easy, and it is not inexpensive. So with their generous support we are able to do today, our lead sponsor is the Area Agency on Aging of Western Michigan. Our partner program host is the Grand Rapids Public Library. Our lead media sponsor is Advanced Newspapers. Our day session sponsors include Sentinel Point Retirement Community, Maple Creek Senior Living, HHS Health Options. Our contributing sponsors include Wood TV8, and Eva Gary Cooper is with us today, and she's going to MC from Wood TV8, so we are grateful for her support. The Grand Rapids Community Foundation, and several members of the Community Foundation are here. You want to raise your hands or stand up? Where are you guys hiding? Oh, Kate's in the back, uh, and we are very appreciative for their support. AARP Michigan, how many of you saw this in the bulletin? All right. That was really a, a great thing that they did by putting that out, but because that came out recently, we got the landslide of registrations in the last week, and I keep saying to our registration folks, well, registration for this event's been open for six months, <laughs> but they've been so overwhelmed with your calls. So for any of you who are unable to get through or had a problem trying to register, I apologize in advance. But you need to know that, they, that that's one phone line with two people who try to answer that, those calls, and they do registration for all the non-credit activity of the college, which includes we have about 15,000 students in non-credit activities. So they were very overwhelmed with this in the last week. So if you had any difficulties, I apologize, but they did their best. And we're glad that you were patient and that you came. Also, I really want to recognize the GRCC Encore Careers Advisory Committee uh, and the uh, Lewis M. Dexter Memorial Foundation for their support. I also have a variety of agencies that support the work of the Older Learner Center and what we do year-round. We couldn't do this kind of programming again without their financial support as well. They include the Area Agency on Aging of Western Michigan, Care Resources, Beacon Hill at Eastgate, Clark Retirement Community, Elders Helpers, HHS Health Options, Maple Creek Senior Living, and Sentinel Point Retirement Community. So you know this is a real community effort. Uh, all of these organizations care about you and care about this work, and that's why they've, they've stood behind it. So on behalf of all of them, I welcome you today, and I'm so glad you could be with us. Now, it looks like almost everyone's in the room. So we will proceed with our program. I'd like to introduce to you Eva Gary Cooper. And uh, for most of you, she doesn't need an introduction. If you've been in Grand Rapids for any period of time, you know Eva. She's the Community Affairs Director at Wood TV8, WOTV4, and WXSP since 1998. So she's celebrating her 15-year anniversary along with the Older Learner Center this year. Um, and so perfect fit. Glad you're here. Uh, her responsibilities include community outreach efforts, on-air reporting for 24-hour News 8, and special station projects. Among those are the Salvation Army Angel Tree Program, collecting toys for children in need, Christmas in May, collecting items for local food pantries, Drive to Live Teen Safety Driving Program, and the Wood TV 8 Connecting with Community Program. 
Her community involvements include participation on various boards and committees, such as Experience Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids Community Foundation, Grand Rapids Sister City Mexico Committee, and ongoing participation in the Hispanic community. Eva's been a great friend to the Grand Rapids Community College Older Learner Center. I think our careers have paralleled these last 15 years, as well as to our Senior Leadership Grand Rapids program. She's supported us on a number of occasions over the years. Eva also has something, as I said, in common with the Older Learner Center in that we're celebrating our anniversary together. Let me end by simply saying that I'm truly thankful for Eva's willingness to support and enhance today's program by serving as both our program moderator and MC. So welcome, Eva. On, but that's all right. Oh, wait, there we go. So we get that thing. All right, here we go. How's this? Okay. Thank you, Mike. It's great to be here. Yeah, I can't believe I think I remember when this all started 15 years ago because we were just all starting on, on the new programming and uh, exciting stuff. I think I've seen some of you at other events and programs over the past few years. It's great to be here. And we're going to have a lively discussion today. Um, I'd like to right away introduce who um, we'll be chatting with in the discussion. And I had the opportunity to meet her last night. We had dinner together and just like, you know how you meet somebody and it's like, God, I feel like we've known each other already for a long time. We just had that connection. Uh, we're going to get the pleasure to meet Marcy. Um, who is a leading authority on the changing face of work and vice president at Encore.org, a nonprofit making it easier for millions of people to pursue second acts for the greater good. We're going to be talking a lot about that today. Her new book, maybe some of you have it, I got mine, The Encore Career Handbook, How to Make a Living and a Difference in the Second Half of Life. And she's also the author of One Person, Multiple Careers, The Original Guide to the Slash Career. So she has a lot of accolade, um, done a lot of great work, also a former media colleague as uh, she wrote, um, here she, she asked the Shifting Careers column and blog for the New York Times and the Working the New Economy blog for Yahoo. Her art articles have appeared in scores of national publications, including the New Time Out New York, Travel and Leisure, The Chronicle of Philanthropy, International Hill Tribune, and more magazines. She's been on the Today Show, NBC Nightly News, NPR, as well as countless other print and web publications. So she's obviously a lady with, uh, I have a lot of respect for, a lot of resources, and just some really good ideas. I'm, I'm happy to call her a new friend. Marcy, come on up to the stage. Let's see if your mic works. Welcome, Marcy. I'm testing. Sounds like it's working, right? Uh, hers works. Because <laughs> you put it on for me, Eva. <laughs> okay, that's all right. I'll okay. use the, uh, the handheld. Um, before we get into the discussion, I know that all of you sat down with an index card where you sat. So at any point in time, if you have a question, there's going to be somebody walking around collecting cards. This is a discussion. We'd like to get your cards while this is going on. You hear something. Write it down. If you don't have a pen and you have a pen you see somebody needs to write, make sure you share your pens with each other. But um, have those questions flowing up throughout our time together. At the very end, we will also have time, if you so choose, to ask a question up at the microphone. So there's lots of times to participate. We want to hear from you. And it's not often we have an expert like this in our midst. So take advantage of it while it's here. Um, one of the things I shared with her last night is uh, I'm in this group. I'm 53 years old, so I'm the 50 plus two. And I'm always thinking about what's my next adventure. You know, I've been in broadcasting for about 30 years now. And it's been a great ride. But I feel like 
I'm going to be ready for something else at some point. You know, this is a crazy business, and it burns you out. Um, and I kind of want to find something, too, that's mission-driven, that I feel really fulfilled doing. And I remember growing up, when I was in college, my mom was 51, and she went back to college, too. And I always thought it was interesting. We were in college together. I was like, wow, my mom went back to school with me. And uh, she always said she wanted to study gerontology. And she goes, you know, I'm getting old, a lot of people getting old, but we're not really old. We just, you know, we still have a lot to do. And I feel like she entered a whole new life. She was in school. She became active in the community. She was an executive director of a nonprofit. I grew up in Detroit. She started to get involved in politics. She started to know, you know, and I was just kind of amazed to see her. The kids were all grown. We were all out of the house. And she took on her own life. And it was really kind of inspirational to me, just kind of starting my college life. And I look back now, I'm my mom's age when she started, and I'm thinking, you know, it's never too late to find that new adventure. That's what I call it. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion. I've been looking at the book, I, and I feel inspired to think there's so much more that we can do, and finally it's something we want to do. And what is that? So my discussion with Marcy last night was really inspiring. I was just like, oh. I found someone who kind of understands me. So, Marcy, I'd like to start the discussion. If you could share, what is this whole Encore movement? How would you describe it to somebody? Right, well, first of all, thanks all for being here, especially for Mike and Kate and the other leaders who have made, and volunteers who have made this happen. Uh, so really, I mean, it's so great that you open this story with your mom. Because your mom is, usually, you know, it's easy to explain something with a story. And we have a story now. And we're going to be, what's your mom's, what was your mom's first name? My mother's name was Lupe. Lupe. We're going to talk about Lupe throughout. Because okay. I have to say, she's like our encore uh, icon. And she did this really a generation before I think it's going to become so big. And so encore, um, loosely defined, is a, a second or third act for the greater good. So. You know, we all um, are familiar with this idea of retirement, right? We've all been conditioned to believe that you work and after, you know, 30 years, you know, the, the lore was you get a watch and you move to the Sun Belt and you, you know, play golf or shuffleboard and, right? And it's perennial leisure. It's like camp for old people, right? It, it's, it, there, there's this concept that we all grew up with that this is what we aspire to, um, a time of constant playing, a time of perennial leisure. And I think for anybody who's kind of aware today, that model's broken. People can't afford that. Um, and even if they can afford it, they don't really want it anymore. I mean, people want to be valuable. People want to use their talents and experience. Um, and there's a whole lot of them. There's, um, <laughs> there's 75 million baby boomers, and these baby boomers are turning 65 at the rate of about 10,000 a day. So this is a huge population coming down the pike. And we see at the organization where I work for, we see this as a huge talent force that's available to solve big pro social problems. But there are people on an individual level that are like your mom was, who are thinking, I'm not done yet. I'm hitting midlife. And instead of thinking about kind of retiring, I'm thinking about my next adventure. What's next? How I can help in my community or in the world? So when we talk about Encore, it's, it's a big spectrum of that. And it's people like you who are maybe going to have some Encore planning years because you're still in the thick of your main career. But it's people like your mom, who was a homemaker, right? For her, her career wasn't really a career. So there are people who, for whom their Encore will be their first career. So this book, it's, uh, it's it, how many of you out there, I saw a couple of you out there that had this book here with you. It's, I was going through it, and it's more than just a handbook. You want to explain kind of the motivation behind this? So um, I first want to give you just a little background on where this Encore movement began, if that's OK. Um, because Grand Rapids is a big part of the early beginnings of this story. So. The reason I, I am doing this work is because of this guy, Mark Friedman, who, um, who wrote the foreword to the book. So I work with Mark Friedman at this national nonprofit, um, Encore.org, that Mark started about 10 years ago. 
And Mark was consumed with, he's a social entrepreneur who's always been in the business of figuring out how to innovate around big social problems. And he was consumed with the idea of the demographics that I just talked to you about. And if you work in the world that even I come from, okay, demographics and the aging population, it's always portrayed as a bad news story. What are we gonna do with all these old people? What are we gonna do with the wave of gray geezers coming down the pike, depleting social security, spending their kids' inheritance, right? This is like a bad thing. We're gonna have more old people than young people. What will the world look like in the future? And Mark didn't see it that way at all. He said, well, what if we flipped that idea on its head and we saw, instead of this aging population as a problem, what if we saw it as an army of problem solvers? People with a lifetime of age, experience, talent, and wisdom who were now gonna enter a stage where they wanted to apply all that talent and wisdom and experience to solving big so social problems. So that's where the Ankar idea was born. And Mark um, and Ankur have done a lot of stuff over the years to popularize the idea and to also plant seeds in communities like Grand Rapids to make this idea a reality. So there are some programs that personify Encore and some of them exist right here in Grand Rapids like Experience Corps, which was started by Encore.org um, when we were called Civic Ventures. And now it w is run by AARP. And ex does it, raise your hand if you've heard of Experience Corps or AARP Experience Corps. Not many, so there are some materials at the back of the table that's an, an organization that um, matches people who are over 55 with school kids to be literacy tutors and mentors. And the idea was that all of these kids need help in school. And all of these retired people have so much to give. And why not match them up in a program that can help solve one of our biggest problems, which is literacy. Um, so we started out with a really looking at service and volunteerism. But what we realized over the years that people are also interested in and need paid work. So Encore has gotten kind of more expansive over the years. And Mark's been going around the country and doing talks like this and writing books like Encore and The Big Shift, which are two other books that I really recommend you read. And they're the books that got me interested in this work. And um, the reason I joined an organization is we were getting to a stage where People get the idea, and people were really enthused about the idea of Encore Careers, but they wanted to know what to do. So what do I do when I leave a meeting like this, and I have to figure out, like, how am I gonna have one of those Encore Careers? I mean, we saw what your mom did, and she's like so many millions of people who have the do-it-yourself model. You, you decide what you're interested in, you find a place to take a class, Grand Rapids Community College right here is a great place to do that. Um, and, and people are figuring it out on their own, but we thought it was time to put together everything we've learned from some of those early pioneers about how to have an encore and put it in one book that really helps people kind of like a do-it-yourself guide. And it really is a good book. Now you mentioned it a little bit, but what kind of drew you into this work? I came to this, um, like I bet many of you in the room can relate to, from both a personal and a professional place. Um, and I'm just going to tell you two quick stories about my own career that explain why I'm so passionate about this. So I've had two career changes so far. I was a lawyer for the first 10 years of my career, and it was a really bad fit. I never loved being a lawyer. And I was a corporate lawyer representing companies that I didn't always agree with. And at some point, I got to the point where I was working so hard for some things that I didn't believe in that I decided I want to step back and make a career change where I could do work that I found more meaningful. I was like craving more purpose in my life, and I think a lot of people can relate to that. So I quit my job, and I tried to um, rediscover my earlier passions, and I like did all the exercises in what colors your parachute, and I met with a career coach, and I took a bunch of classes, and I went back to my earlier interests, which were writing, and I eventually became a journalist. Um, but it was hard going. I, taught, I took all these classes, and I networked, and I found mentors who were just out of college because they knew more than I did. And I just found it, and I was young at the time. I was in my 30s, and I still found that that was a very hard transition. But when I finally made it to the other end, and I became a journalist, and I started writing for the New York Times and all these other publications, I decided that I was so interested in how the world of work was changing and how, that we, how we always have to change to keep up with that 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 became the subject, the focus of my writing. 
So I started this blog and a column for the New York Times called Shifting Careers, and I wrote my first book. And, um, and I started trying to keep up with all the trends around work and careers, and that's how I heard about the Encore movement. I met Mark Friedman, and I interviewed him for the New York Times, and I wrote several pieces about the Encore movement and what was happening in this world. And then, in the midst of all of that, and I'm writing high, I've got this really popular blog, and I'm doing social media, and I'm doing all the things that journalists do to try to stay relevant and in the game. And then the recession hit, and I started writing about the recession and all these people who were losing their jobs, and, and then the Times canceled my column and blog. And I was at this career columnist suddenly out of work. And I thought, wow, this is hitting me very personally. Um, so I did what very few journalists had done at that point, but it became very popular afterwards. I wrote a column about my own ending, yes. Oh, so a handheld may be better. Or just move it over to this side. Sure. Let's try the other weapon. Actually, if she just will. You want me to try the other side? Good. Okay. How's this? Is this better? Yeah, it's more consistent. Okay, let's stay with that. So sorry. So um, I, I, I'm sorry if you've missed some of this, but I was telling my own story about how I came to this work, and it really involves these two career transitions that I went through personally. And my first one was voluntary. I left one profession, and I had this hard slog to figure out how to become a journalist. But then um, I, was, I lost my journalism gig, and I had to figure out the Times was laying off people, and I understood that it felt like it wasn't about me, it was about the economy, but it was a really hard blow to be a person who was writing about layoffs and the recession, and then to suddenly live that. So I wrote about it on the New York Times website. I wrote about what happened to me, and a couple of interesting things happened. I got my next job offer, and I went to work for Yahoo, but I also got a note from Mark Friedman at Encore.org, and he said, I want to start talking to you about maybe coming to work for this organization that I run, because I think we need to figure out how to popularize the Encore idea in a way that helps people figure out what they should do next. And so that's how I came to this work. It was very personal to me, but I also realized that I was just around um, in my early 40s when that happened. And I was very personally interested, like Eva is, in like what my next steps were going to look like, because it was pretty clear that I was never going to retire. Like I don't feel like I'm building towards retirement. I think I'm going to be working the next 30 years or so. And I have to figure out, um, what does that look like? What does it look like to be constantly learning and reinventing yourself and staying current? And I feel like the work that's being done at Encore is the way to, for all of us to start thinking about that. Um, I know for maybe some of us out here, I was just curious, how many are currently searching and not working? Just for the next step, okay. How many are working and want to transition into something else? All right, so there's a little bit of half and half here. Your job to help other people figure out their next steps. Okay. Yeah. There's a chapter in the book here that you were talking, it's the slash careers. I didn't know if you wanted to, to talk about that. The, the, so the, the, the first book I wrote, which grew out of a column I wrote for the New York Times, is about a model of work that I think is becoming increasingly prevalent um, called the slash career or the hyphenate, whichever you want to call it, which is many, many of us need a lot of slashes to define who we are and what we do. And Mike is a perfect example of that. You know, Mike's teaching at Grand Rapids Community College, and he's leading the senior encore task force on the side. And it's all the things that make up a complete life these days. And Eva, I know everybody knows of you because of your work on television, but you're involved in all of this community work here also that I learned about last night. So you're slashing, even though you have a full-time job. So the model of, you know, there's so many people who in their encore life will be living a portfolio life where there'll be some things you do for pay, some things you do out of passion. Maybe you have an artistic pursuit that you're eager to pursue, but the slash mindset can help you think about how do you build a life that lets you be many things at once. You haven't been working for a while, and at this time, too, if you have some questions and you want to start bringing them up, we can start filtering through. I think uh, we have somebody here that will start collecting cards. Just hold your cards up. I just want to make sure I get to your questions. If you're in the position where you're not working, 
you know you want to do something. You're seeking for your next purpose, your next adventure, your next career. And maybe you haven't been out there in a long time and you think, how do you even get started? It's intimidating to even think about, well, where do I go? Where do I start? I haven't been on a computer in years. I don't get into the social media stuff. You know, it's just like, it's hard to find your value, even though we all have something. We all have our own gifts. So where do you begin? I'd say there's two parts to it. There's the stuff that happens in your head, and then there's the stuff that happens in the world. And so uh, the book is designed um, to help you with ideas for both pieces of it, because you may choose to work on them concurrently, or you may be the kind of person who first needs to work in your head, or first needs to go out in the world. So there's no right order to any of this. But, but the in your head stuff is um, to really um, do some evaluating of who you are at this stage in your life. So many of us made life choices 20 or 30 years ago, and they were based on who we were 20 or 30 years ago. And you may not be that person anymore, and you may have discovered all kinds of new interests. It's also possible that there was stuff you were interested in 20 or 30 years ago that you didn't pursue because you needed to go out and make a living and raise a family or you know life got in the way kind of stuff. So for, for some people, it's exploring new interests. For some people, it's revisiting things. But, and one of the best ways that I encourage people to do that kind of thinking is to do the exercises in this book, or they're available in other, other kinds of places too. Career counselors offer assessments. There are online, all kinds of free assessments. But I just say go sit with a cup of tea or coffee in your play, favorite place and do that, or do these exercises and ask yourself those hard questions like, what have, what have given me joy in periods of life? What are the kind of high point experiences? There's also a piece of what am I really good at that I do all the time that I never want to do again? I can't tell you how many people that I meet at the encore stage who say, all I know is I never want to manage a budget or manage another person again. Like there are these things we know for sure when we hit a certain life stage. And then the second piece, and I think in some ways this is even more important, is to get out in the world and do things. And Mike's going to talk to you about some ideas, because um, there's something right here even in tomorrow. There's some kind of volunteer fair going on that Mike's going to tell you about. Um, and watching Eva on TV is another way to get really good ideas of things to do, because Eva's always covering community activities here in the Grand Rapids area. But that's a little bit about what, uh, what we want this uh, event to expose people to. Volunteering is really one of the best ways to go out and try something out. And volunteering, I have, I have a whole chapter on the, out into the book because volunteering is a really big tent. There's everything from grassroots on the ground, working with the homeless, working with the environment, working in a kind of a, a really on the ground way on an issue you care about, to working as a board member for an uh, organization that needs your help, to being a pro bono advisor if you have professional services or expertise that you want to offer. So think about all the big, wide ranges of ways. And every time you try an activity, remember that you're, you're doing good work and you're going to feel really good about that and you're going to meet people and you're going to network. But you're also deciding, do I want to do more of this? Do I want to do less of this? It's all part of your process of figuring out where you should go next. I'll try to get to most of them right here too. One of the questions is, um, how does one get those in command of an organization to accept an encore performer without feeling threatened? Because chances are you're probably going to be working for someone younger. That's a good question. We had a meeting this morning, and this was a huge topic of conversation. So uh, I, it comes up in every discussion we have. So I, I like to think of the encore movement really as like where the women's movement was in maybe the 1960s. And you know, every woman that joined an organization or went to work was often the first woman. I can't tell you how many people I interviewed for this book, women in their 60s or 70s, who told me, oh, I'm the first person in this uh, master's program I'm doing right now. And I was also the first person in my, you know, in my law school class or in my, um, in my nonprofit job. Or, you know, so there is this sense that if you are of a certain age, and you are getting a new role somewhere that you might be the only one in your age category where you show up. So there's a burden there of making sure that, you know, that A, 
you create an atmosphere that's welcoming to other people of that age down the pike and that you also, you're kind of an ambassador for what it's like to be having a workforce that is going to have people of all ages hanging around. So we all need to do a lot of work on advocating what are the attributes that older workers bring to the workforce. And there are so many of them. There's emotional st stability. There's maturity. There's a certain kind of commitment and work ethic. And there's wisdom. And there's the stuff that you only know from life experience. Like when your mother said she wanted to be a gerontologist, she said that because she realized that there's some stuff you only know when you start to age. And she was feeling that. And she was feeling that. And everybody's aging around her. And they're going to need certain kinds of help and certain kinds of understanding and empathy. And all that stuff gets better as we age. So. It's a, I'm not, I don't want to come out here and tell you that having an encore career is easy. And if you're doing encore work where you're the first person to break into an organization or to be doing a certain kind of work, or it's going to be hard, which is why um, it's really important that there's a growing community of people who can support each other in this, and which is why we're doing this kind of tour through town hall meetings like this, where people meet other people in the community who are going through the same things who can help one another. I mean, one of you is going to get hired somewhere and going to say, oh, I met someone at that event who would be perfect, and bring another person in, and that's how it happens. This is an interesting question, too, I can relate to, because many cultures uh, treat their elders differently depending on the culture you come from. And here in the U.S., I don't think it's the same. I know the culture I grew up in, your relatives get older, you know what, they come and live with you. It's just the way it is, you know. It's, it's the, more of a Latino culture. Uh, there's not that many homes in Mexico. They live with the family. And here in the U.S., I think culturally you get to a certain point, you're off to the home. And um, so not that that's for sure everywhere in the United States, but... Are there other countries developing Encore? Yes. So um, a big part of our work, um, we have, we're a tiny organization. We only have 21 people who work in Encore. So we rely on leaders on the ground who hear about this idea and want to take off and roll with it. And that is now starting to happen all over the world. We have this Australian woman who's coming to visit our organization for two months. And she's touring the US visiting Encore organizations all around the country with the uh, um, interest of bringing this back to Australia. There's a whole lot of interest in Ireland where there's been um, foundation investment in building up this Encore idea in Ireland. There's been interest in the UK. There's been interest, um, some of our people have spoken in Germany. Two of our col my colleagues spoke in Korea a few months ago. So the, the issues that are fueling the Encore movement, the demographic shift, is happening around the world. So there's no reason to think that uh, there won't be interest in this. And you may hear about this by another name in some other country. But we, we think it's important to export this idea. And when other countries, when peop organizations and foundations from other countries talk to come to talk to us, we always make time and educate them and share what we've learned and share our research and all of those kinds of things. Phenomenon then. OK, we're getting some really good questions here. I want to try to get to as many as we can. Um, in our high, t high technology world of computers, how will one be able to fit in and be productive in a new career without becoming proficient with computers? Excellent question, and one of the most common questions I get. So this is an issue that everyone's really concerned with. You know, Will I be able to do this job? Like, how, how important is technology for me to do my encore work? And you know what? We had a meeting this morning, and my closing slide, I had a slide about all the places you can connect with encore.org online. You could join our email list. You could follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn. And, a, and someone came to me and said, I don't have a computer. How can I follow you on all of those places? So I thought, you know, I'm, I'm actually guilty of this a little too because we do use a lot of you know, tech tools to even do the Encore work that we're doing. So certainly some familiarity with computers and technology is becoming more important for all of us. Um, but so much of the work that needs to be done in communities is hand-to-hand, -hand, is, is not reliant on technology. I did a program last week with Teach for America. How many people have heard of Teach for America? Great. So Teach for America is known as the new kind of prestige pathway for young people, right? Super smart kids coming out of college give two years to become teachers in high needs areas. 
Well, Teach for America came to us and said, we want to recruit Encore Stage people because the schools need people with life experience. So we did this webinar, and 500 people signed up to do our webinar. We promoted it with Teach for America. And I had three people on the call with me who were Teach for America alumni over 50 who did the program because they heard about it because their kid had done it or some young person they knew and they wanted to become a teacher in the same way. And when I asked them how important it was to do technology and to be a, you know, a teacher in one of these high need schools. And they all said that the technology to be a speaker on the webinar was way harder than anything they'd ever done as a teacher using new technology. They also told me that um, the best thing about being a teacher was you have all of these young people who could teach you technology so they were all getting tutored by their middle school students in how to be better at technology. Showing you how to run the TV, the camera, the VCR. It's like, can you fix this for me? And they're like three years old and they're like, yeah. Told me, one of them told me um, that her third graders were Facebooking her on her phone. So she was learning from her third graders. She had to download this app for her phone so that she can hear from her students. So what was interesting is one woman said to me, oh, our school has no budget for technology, so we don't even have any computers. We don't have any kind of technology. I'm teaching the same way that I was taught in 1953. So most of the hard work that needs to be done in, commu in communities is not relying on technology. It's, requir it's requiring the kind of face-to-face -face, um, contact that is so important to making social change happen. So that, you know, if you, when you get into figuring out what it is you want to do, you will find out if there's any technology you need to do the job or to do the application process for that job. And then it's important to get the help you need so that that doesn't become an obstacle. But don't assume that technology is going to be a barrier or an essential requirement. Um, we're always looking at hiring, you know, young people that come into the station and they're tech savvy and they know social media. But you know what they're lacking? Just sometimes human interaction. They don't know how to look you in the eye. They don't know how to give you a handshake. They're not used to, you know, we grew up, we talked to each other. We would go, and it's, a, um, it's almost a danger, too, that this younger generation is coming up with all this technology, and they talk to each other on Twitter and Facebook when they're right in the next room. And they're losing that communication of basic skills. I mean, that's something that you possess a real talent. You know how to talk to people. You know how to look them in the eye. You know how to give a good handshake. You know the importance of being present when someone's talking and not, you know, oh, yeah, 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 you know, how many times have you been there and everybody's checking their email? So don't think of the things that you grew up with aren't important and do stand out. I just got a question here that leads right into that. You know, because of how we see ourselves, most employees see gray hair and they close the door. How can we get employers to open these doors, open their eyes, and, you know, how do you get your foot in and not get locked out because of what they immediately see? And it might not be what they see, but what we think they see. Okay, so it has to start with your own self-image. So you have to know that you are capable of doing the job that you're applying for. So a lot of that is be honest. Do you need any kind of skills updating? You know, so do you need to refresh yourself in some way so that you are the, a, a competitive candidate for a job that you're considering? Um, and don't assume that you're going to be ruled out because your age is evident. So uh, that's one thing I want to make, make very, very clear. And also understand that not every workplace is going to be really welcoming and age friendly. And you have to focus on where are the areas where you've already seen, you know, you've already seen that there's age friendliness. You've already seen that people know how to value experience and, um, and age and wisdom. So you, if you're not in the mood to be a pioneer, then don't go to organizations where you're going to be the first. And when you get in, make sure that you're part of the consciousness about how important it is to recruit people of all ages. Because everyone in this room has the power to be both an encore person in a new role, but an encore influencer of employers' attitudes. And that can happen every time you sit down and talk to someone who is in the capacity to hire. You could talk about this great event you, you went to and how you met all these people who are getting new roles in their 60s and 70s and making a difference in all kinds of ways. Tell an encore story of someone you met who is making a difference in a new role. That's going to change minds. Like it's, it's, it's important that all of us be both doers in this and advocates for others. 
where you go and you get served or service or need assistance or what, what your, your daily lives. And a lot of times, wouldn't it be nice if somebody was working with you that understood you, was your age, kind of knew your needs, how you wanted things, and not necessarily somebody, you know, a lot younger. So and that's another thing that I've often thought about is where are there people like me that I can help others and maybe in a job in that area. Um, a question that's come up a couple of times in a couple of different ways, and I'll ask is, is is, um, you know, how does one determine what type of work they might want to do for an encore, or how much time should one take to decide, you know, to make a, a new transition? Good questions. And the book really gets into that in a whole lot of detail. So um, it's going to be different for everyone. Some, some people are sitting here and you know what you want to do, you just have to figure out how to get there. But I meet lots of people who say, oh, I like this idea, but I have no idea what I want to do. Um, so they're starting from a place of, I've got to first figure that out. So the book gets at it at two ways. One is that kind of do some exploration through trying things out, through doing exercise, through kind of self-reflection and all of that. And the other piece of it is to look at where are the high growth fields and see if any of those are interesting to you. So we have a hot jobs list at the end of the book, which talks about these are up and coming fields that are encore friendly, meaning there's gonna be job growth and they're very conducive to people who have experience under their belt. So one of my favorites is, I mean, gerontology, what you mentioned, is a huge field that's attracting people who are getting to an age where maybe they've done some caregiving in their life, maybe they've realized that they, they, they are thinking about their own mortality and I think that gets people very interested. Wellness is a huge field and really all kinds of new roles in healthcare. As we roll out the Affordable Healthcare Act, which is obviously gonna happen even though it's been stalled, there are a whole lot of roles in there um, that people are going to need to be educated about their healthcare options. People are going to need healthcare navigators. There's all kinds of community healthcare roles that are helping up. And there's all kinds of private roles and public roles where people are working on becoming wellness coaches, trying to be keep people out of the hospital before they get sick. There's all these kind of non-medical healthcare roles that we see hugely on the rise, and there are private businesses around these things. There are people who are specializing in home modification to help people age in place. There are people who have uh, gone back to school to get a caregiver certificate. There's one couple in the book I wrote about who started a business on caregivers who travel, traveling companions. And it, this was a business started by a retired pilot and his wife, who was a homemaker. And the wife had had some caregiving experience in her life. And the pilot had seen all these people traveling without their family members. So they, they got, went back to community college. They got some certification in caregiving. They hired a fleet of people to help them. And they started this business called care to go And their motto is, we get grandma to the wedding. And they have, you know, I mean, I've been seen people who are attacking this with all kinds of creativity and entrepreneurial spirit. Um, just checking on the time, because we want to leave some time for you to be able to ask questions or maybe tell us your encore story. I know we have a, a few of you who wanted to do that. One of the questions I had here, too, um, real basic, sorry I didn't mention it before. Marcy's last name, how do you pronounce it? Alberher. A-L-B-O-H-E-R. And they said the name of her book is Encore Career Handbook. I just called her Marcy. Like, you know, we're, we're old girlfriends. Alba her, A-L-B-O-H-E-R, if you wanted to know her last name and her book. So sorry about that, that I didn't give that out right away. Um, some of the other questions here, too. And, you know, Mike, you might even know some of these questions, too. Are there student loans for people older, assistance for college? that are specifically for older people going to school. But that, that means all the same loans that are available for younger people are of, often available to older people. So if you're going, the best way to figure out about student loans as assistance is to look at the very specific program you're interested in applying to and then go meet with the financial aid office and see what they offer because they're gonna be varied opportunities based on your income level, based on what's happening at a, a specific um, school and also know that um, if you have one of these accounts, these 529B accounts that people use to raise, to save money for their kids' education, those can also be used for your own education. So that's kind of a little known loophole that people don't 
don't do. We have a whole chapter on education in the book, and there's a whole bunch about financing your education. There's also a whole chapter on financial planning that um, I really want people to think a lot about. How would you plan for this chapter of your life? And a lot of people think about the going to school thing as something they can do while they're still working to prepare so that they don't have a period where they're both paying for school and not earning an income. So if you can use some time where you're still on the job or earning income in some other way to get a new credential, it's a good way to keep your expenses down and not have a period where you're just shelling out for school and not earning a living. You talked about earlier how um, we're going into the Affordable Care Act. There's going to be a lot of need for people to assist others. You also, she also has a section in her book that you talk specifically about some pretty hot careers or some of the areas that you might consider, because this is one of the questions, a couple of them here that kind of touch on this. Um, worked really hard for long hours for many years. Again, we kind of know what we don't want to do anymore. I don't want to do that again. What part-time opportunities might be available that can still generate income? So uh, when I said that the hot jobs list in the back of the book is about encore friendly jobs, one of the definitions about encore friendly is we looked at what are the kinds of fields that you can do part time or as a consultant or a on your own in some way, because that's something that people really want at this life stage. Um, we are not hearing from people, um, oh, I'm turning 50 or 60 and I want to work as hard as I worked for the last 30 years. Most people really want to do something that matters in the world. But they want to do it on their own terms. We're hearing that all the time, that they may want flexibility. We all hear about the bucket list, right? And you want to travel. You want to be with your kids or your grandkids or you know, spend some time on some hobby that you've never um, had time for. So the Encore idea is not to deny you any of that, but it's to say that work could be a substantive piece of what you do. So part-time work is, is, um, is kind of assumed in everything we're talking about, that people don't necessarily want to work the crazy kind of hours that they used to work. So, you know, there's so many jobs I go back to, wellness, where you could be a coach or a counselor. We see a lot of people who are going into social work, who are going to become therapists of various kinds, everything from physical therapists to um, uh, addiction counselors to all of these kinds of jobs that often can be done a certain number of hours a week rather than in a full-time way. I think... Um People are asking, how do they get a copy of your book? <laughs> and the, and uh, are there any discounts? And I know you had some of these earlier. Discounts on the books? Okay, so. Oh, okay. So, sure. Okay, two, two. So the book is available everywhere books are sold. Um, they, uh, what's your local bookstore here, uh, the independent? Schuler's has it in stock, and the local Barnes and Nobles have it in stock. We checked. It's also available online at Amazon and you know any other places that books are sold. Our publisher will make um, bulk discounts available if you buy more than 50 copies. They're available at, at wholesale, half price. And Mike can be the point person on that, so get in touch with Mike Faber if you have, have an organizational need for the book. I'm reading these cards, right? A lot of them are in cursive. <laughs> You know how many of our kids aren't learning cursive anymore? And it's just like, how are they going to do this when they're in a group like this? All right, pull out your iPhones and tweet me. It's done. I've been at these conferences. It's all um, up on the screen. People text it from their cell phone. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I can still read cursive. How many of these kids aren't going to be able to even read cursive? See, there's something else we know. The other thing, nobody's tweeting this event. Is anybody tweeting this event? That's the thing, like if a, we have a tweeter. We got a tweeter. Okay, I'm Hey Marcy on Twitter, H-E-Y-M-A-R-C-I. But you know, if this were an event for a bunch of 25 year olds, it would live on in the you know, cyberspace forever because people would be tweeting it and they wouldn't be listening to us. Interesting observation, it's just like, yeah, you're not gonna be able to do this, no. Um, so when you know career directions, uh, or career directories for artists, sculptors, but need income, you know, to sort of to break in or to get started, say you have a desire or something you really want to do, but, you know, how do you get that to uh, maybe fulfill a dream you've always wanted to do, those backers? Say that again. I'm trying to understand. What I understand here, um, need income to, you know, like breaking in, and they said something about artists, sculptors, you know, to, to sort of get started. Maybe that's something you've always wanted to do. 
You know, a lot of people have this issue of you know, they want to marry an artistic passion with doing some good in the world. And like, how do you do that? And, you know, there are all kinds, and there's a lot of stories in the book about people who have taken that kind of passion and, and found a nonprofit that's doing work with kids where, um, or, or some way to teach in a youth program or teach in a retirement home and kind of use that ability to teaching others as a way to both kind of satisfy your own artistic urges and a way to earn some income and a way to do good all at the same time. So a lot of what the book talks about and what I see with people when they're trying to plan their course is how can I weave a lot of strands together? So let's say, you know, I'm interested in traveling and I'm or I'm interested in being outdoors and I want to help people. So I met people who marry those things and say, wow, I found this opportunity to be a park ranger and I get to be outside in the national park all the time and they relocate for something like that. Or there's a guy in the book I met who um, was a freelance writer and you know how hard that life can be and he was chasing stories all the time and he kind of liked what he did but he was burning out and his passion was sailing on the side. He, sa he sailed all the time and he was hanging around at the marina one day and he said to the guy who owned the tackle shop, he said, you know, if I could just figure out how to do this for a living, I would be the happiest man on the planet. And he's like, I know someone you should talk to. And he hooked him up with this scouting organization that takes um, groups of youth out in sailboats as a kind of a youth enrichment program. The guy got a job, he works there full time, he sails for a living now. And um, it's just a perfect example of you got to start talking about what it is that you want to do, what would mean something to you, and you do have to be creative, which is why I'm encouraging people, and we're going to talk about some tools at the end. We have this Encore Transition Guide that's free that you could download on our website. If you go, um, we'll put up a slide afterwards, Mike, because we have a slide for that. And if you want to work with others, there's going to be an Encore Transition Group that's happening right here in Grand Rapids. Mike's going to tell you how you sign up for that. There's a sign-up sheet at the back table. But I think it's really important to meet with some other people so you can help one another to brainstorm ideas and figure out how do you take these ideas, these random ideas that are floating around in your head, and turn them into something. In your book, I remember seeing a section, too, um, and it's, not, it's a little bit more than just networking. But, you know, like you were just reminding me when you were saying something you're interested in, how do you call someone that you know is sort of in that business or in that area or in that uh, kind of a career? Because it's like if you can just start talking to people who are doing what you want to do or somehow be affiliated with it, I think sometimes there's a fear. Well, I don't know them. Well, they talk to me. How do you, how do you go about that? And, and I know you went into great detail about that in the book. A huge fan of informational interviews, and if you know anybody in their 20s, their whole life is informational interviews. They're calling up people, they're finding out what they do for a living, they're taking them out for a coffee. Every time you go through a transition in life, you should find your mentors, you should find your gurus, you should do that often and be respectful of people's time, but you'll find that people are who are doing work that they care about and that are important to the community, they're gonna be generous with their time. They're gonna wanna talk to you. You just have to be respectful of their time um, and go with your right questions and pick the right moment and, um, and approach people. I have a lot of scripts and ideas for how to do that in the book, but the other thing that I want to put in your head is that think about doing that across generational lines. It may be that your best connection at a place where you want to understand is one of your kid's friends or someone much, much younger than you. And don't be shy about that. I mean, I network with people younger than me all the time. We are at the stage where the people who are moving and shaking may not be our peers, they may be our kid's peers. You know, I used to write a lot about LinkedIn. I'm really a big fan of LinkedIn as a, an online c career and social networking portal. How many people in the room have a LinkedIn profile? Good. If you don't, I am going to encourage you to go on LinkedIn and poke around. Uh, set up a profile, learn about org. It's a great tool for thinking about how to move forward in any kind of work you want to do. But LinkedIn used to be a place that was known for young people would get out of college and then they would ask their parents if they could look at all their peers, right, because their parents had all the big jobs and they want to look at their parents' connections. Now I meet all these Encore people who want to look at their kids' LinkedIn's networks to see who they can meet in their networks, which is very interesting to me. This kind of goes right along the, those lines is that um, don't you feel that there is some resistance on employers to hire due to the vision of gray hair, but we as the gray hairs, S sometimes that attitude is something that, that we possess. 
being resistant to joining an organization where there are young people with tattoos and piercings, even though they are intelligent or could be and capable, shouldn't we also be more open? And that kind of goes to. That question came up. Yes, yes, yes. Just as a person who doesn't text as their first mode of communication shouldn't be discriminated against, so should um, a person, you know, we have to, we have to, this has to work both ways. So in, in our encore kind of, uh, kind of uh, the way we like to look at the world, we are not we are not advocating that older people should be taking jobs from younger people or that it's always better to hire an older person than a younger per person. In the ideal vision and what we really need to get to is a workforce that understands the value of people at all these different life stages and knows how to knit them together. And the best workplaces, you know, we're, we're getting a little better in our country on, on racial diversity and gender diversity and we're, we still have a long way to go in certain workplaces and in certain industries Industries. But age diversity is the next battle that is coming up for all of us, which we have to figure out that we need people. You know, there's a, a longevity expert who's on our board, Laura Karstensen. She founded the Center for Longevity at Stanford University, and she always says, we don't just need strong and fast. We also need emotional stability and maturity. So we need all of those things represented in the workplace. And it's, it's our job to also value what youth brings. A great meeting is a meeting where you've got a whole different kind of ideas around the table and people who approach something from different life experiences and different um, vantage points. There can be really nice people that are older, and there can be really mean people that are older. And there can be young people that are really cool and open to, you know, your wisdom and experience. And there can be young people that, you know what, you just don't have to deal with them either. So, you know, there are, there are all, all types in, in our, you know, comings and goings when, in life. And, but I think that question is true that a lot of times we immediately feel that there's a prejudice. And a lot of times it's our own fear. We have to get over that if we want to move on. I do want to leave some time here. We, I know we still have some great questions, by the way. This has been awesome. But I want to um, allow some time because I think there were some people that wanted to come up to the microphone and um, you know tell us their encore moment or also share with us another question. And I, I know we had that, so I want to allow for some time for that. Uh, there's, there's one over there. Go ahead. Tell us your name and where you're from. I make all students. Yes, right. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, you've hinted towards this, but in the process of redefining yourself, can you speak a little more to how volunteerism affects what you do? If you're interested in horseback riding, do you volunteer for the... Can you speak? Right. Volunteerism, I can't say enough how volunteerism is often the front door to someone's encore. And I'm going to go back to Eva here because I heard last night about the com countless number of things Eva does in this community on, the, on several boards. Um, you know, each of these volunteer activities that we do introduces to us to a, a whole bunch of people who share our passion, who care about the same causes, who care about the same social issues. It expands your network but it also lets you try something out and you learn stuff. Um, volunteering can often be a way to learn how an organization works or to learn a skill set that you want to learn. Like I'm, I've just gone on my first board and there's this whole onboarding process, process where I'm learning all about how nonprofit boards work and I'm learning about fundraising and I went there because I'm going to be offering media expertise. That's why they asked me to be on the board, but I'm learning all kinds of things about how this particular organization runs that's a gift of being a volunteer in that organization. So um, I hope that answers part of And the other thing that volunteering does is it gives you something to put on your resume that shows the experience that you got that's recent and connected to what you want to be doing. And think about the volunteering both in a functional way and in a content way. So for example, let's say you, um, I met a woman this morning who told me that she's really experienced at grant writing. So she can take, if she did some pro bono work for an organization around grant writing, and let's say it was a homelessness organization, two things have happened. She has recent grant writing experience on her resume, but she has a new level of expertise about homelessness and what's going on with homelessness in this community. So there's content aspect to it and then the functional aspect to it. So you could use the volunteering to help you on either front, like, and usually 
if you have a skill set, you can then learn about a new subject area by offering your skills to a nonprofit or a social purpose organization that needs this expertise you bring. But it works the other way too, that often you get in because you have passion about the issue. Like I, there's a woman in the book who is passionate about um, her dog had become a therapy dog. And she had firsthand experience with what that meant to go through that program and to work in nursing homes with a dog and all of the, she, she brought this firsthand experience. But her, she ended up helping them um, as a financial advisor because she had financial expertise. So I think there's you know, a lot of different ways this unfolds. How many of you remember Warren Reynolds in this town? Yeah, he was, uh, he's a longtime broadcaster who passed away now about 10 years ago. He was like my first mentor when I started working at the station. I worked with Warren. And um, I'll never forget one of the things he taught me in terms of volunteering and being, you know, Warren was constantly out there. He was always at some event, people volunteering. I said, you know, gosh, Warren, it's like, you know, where do you find the time? It just seemed like endless. And he said, I am so lucky that people want me to help them. And he turned it around and he said, I get more out of it than they do. I mean, the man was constantly busy, and he was truly uh, a great mentor for me and taught me a lot, but I'll never forget that statement. It's not like, well, yeah, I like to do this. I'm lucky that they want me to help them, and that's really true. And, I, and when you talk to volunteers who really are into things, they say, you know, it's not what I do. It's what I get back. And, and a lot of times the satisfaction that you get knowing you've made a difference or that you've helped out is, is even greater than anything else. And until you put yourself out there, you don't always – you know, get to experience that. So I know it's it's something that you receive. Because, I mean, I look at someone like Eva and I think, how do you have the time? And I think one of the things that we're not acknowledging is often that volunteer activity serves many purposes in your life. I mean, it's often very social. So for many people, there's an overlap and they can't exactly untie the part of their life, there's their paid work versus the social thing versus the, all of the volunteer I work, it, the work that I do is around um, better access to media. I work with a lot of organizations around mentoring writers. And when I'm at these organizations, I'm always with my friends. There's other people who are media people and writers who are in the same organization. And it's how I see them socially because everybody's so busy. So there is this... Um, multi-pronged thing that happens when, when volunteering and service just becomes woven into your life. It becomes a little easier. We have uh, another, tell us your name. Uh, Wayne Hill. I have just a little story to tell because it, uh, it's, it's all about the Encore movement. You know, I retired working at General Motors for 32 years, and it was a job. But uh, after they forced me into retirement, I wanted to do something else. You know, I didn't want to go stand at Target or Walmarts and be a greeter. I didn't want to do that. What I, what I, wanted, I wanted to do something more meaningful. So uh, I got the opportunity to go to college at Grand Rapids Community College. And, and, but I had a fear of going back. But, you know, with the, with the people there, the instructors, uh, even the young people there, I mean, they just kept on encouraging me to, to stick with it and hang in there. You know, so... Now, my plan is to have a career as a social worker one day and, and help seniors, not just the young people, but I want to help seniors. So my field will be going into gerontology field, you know. And so that's what I want to do because I'm getting older. I'm 59 right now. And so I need to know more information about how to take care of myself and look at life in a different perspective and get a better understanding about growing older because my mother never had that opportunity and I watched her kind of dwindle away at growing older, but she didn't know what to do for herself. But now we have a great opportunity to go back and get some education so we can, we can grow older, more mature, and, and be, do something more meaningful with your life to help others, you know? So young people mentor us and it's okay. You know, and I don't have a problem with that. Volunteering, I volunteered, and I met some wonderful older people at a senior center. You know, so going back to school was scary for a while, but you know what? It's a struggle going back after being out of school for 30 years, but it's a, it's a great experience, and I have, I have a great feeling about achieving my goal now. Thank you. That.
guess uh, I want to encourage all of us to kind of bloom where we're planted. Uh, things like uh, today is the first day of the rest of our life type talk. That's all motivational stuff. Uh, just in a nutshell, I pastored uh, churches for 15 years. Met a guy named Larry Burkett. Anybody heard of him? Yeah. Uh, he turned me around, so I left the parish and formed a organization called Merging Faith and Finance, which deals with the biblical concepts of finance. And so at first I called myself uh, an insurance agent. Then I got kind of reborn into being a financial advisor. Then I met Mark Friedman uh, 12 years ago, and I became a senior advisor and formed uh, the term rehirement, serving God in new and marvelous ways. Uh, and uh, uh, things kept changing. Uh, a couple of years ago, I added my, to my encore becoming uh, Medicare certified because right now it's open enrollment season and uh, everybody's going crazy trying to understand Obamacare. Uh, but in, in advising seniors, uh, especially those who are seeking work or want to be retooled, I, I, I tell them, three things, and that now there's one being added because of Obamacare. I've got more experience, I've got wisdom, I've got loyalty, because uh, I'm not just in it for me, and every employer knows the younger adults, and a lot of them are in it for me. Now you can tell them, uh, I'm also more economical for you, because on January 1st, it's a level playing field for insurance costs. One of the reasons employers haven't been old, hiring older adults is not because they may be slower uh, and, and not as much energy. They cost more for benefits. Now in health insurance, you're more of a bargain because the 25-year-old is costing the same amount as you. Where before, you were costing two or three times the amount for health insurance. So now you can go in there with a better package. And uh, go in there positive. You've got more to offer than some of these young squirts who are just getting off the, the block. Oh, wow. Okay. We've got time for maybe another question. And then I know, um, Mike, you had some other housekeeping and, and information to get out there. But, uh, you know, it's a, it, I think we can inspire each other and, and walk this path. And there's lots of tools, what Marcy's sharing. There's books, there's communities, there's organizations, there's each other. And, and uh, my husband has a great saying. He says it all the time. You know, you're never too old to have a happy childhood. And I, I love that because it's like inside, I don't feel my age. I think a lot of us are that way. I remember. I know how vital I am. I know what inspires me. And then, you know, it's when you look in the mirror and you look at your driver's license, you realize, oh, those are the years. But again, it, somebody told me too, it, it's a number and I don't let it define me. And I just found out the other day, I'm the oldest female on the air in our market. And I said, all right, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Um, it is a younger industry. I do have a shelf life that at some point I'll have to worry about. But, uh, you know, it's, it's the fact that I, I'm still doing what I'm doing. And, yes, they get younger and younger, and it's TV and all that stuff. But I felt kind of proud of that. And, you know, we have a voice. And it's how I look at myself. And I surround myself with people that make me feel the way I feel inside and not the way society kind of brands us because of the year we happen to be. So things like this today, and I think the information that Marcy has, and you know, when we were talking last night, it's just sort of inspiring to rekindle who you know you are inside and not the number that you are. And there's lots of tools, and there's a lot more of us out there. So we are definitely a majority on that. I don't know if you wanted to say anything else, too, in closing before we pass it on. I guess the, the last, I'll say this really quickly, is just understand, like, there are a lot of people, I think, as I look around, who are in this or entering this demographic their, themselves. And what I want you to understand, though, 
this is just not just about baby boomers. This idea has the potential to be transformative for future generations. So the next time we have a town hall meeting like this, I'd love to have a bunch of young people in the room too, thinking about how they can be entering a world that really values people at every life stage, because they're going to grow up and be that you know, we're all going to grow into this life stage. So, you know, if you were born in the developing world today, you are very likely to hit 100. And if that's going to be the case, we have to build a life course that really understands how to keep people engaged through all those extra years we're going to have. Like, we don't just jump off a cliff when we hit, you know, a certain number. We have to figure out what does it look like to have an engaged and productive life for all those years. So we're paving the way so that your kids and their grandkids um, can be aging into something really new and different as well. Mike? Before I wrap things up, we have a few, just a few more minutes. Um, anyone have any pressing questions? I don't want someone to leave today without asking that question. Uh, you know, that same question you have, probably the person next to you does as well. So anyone with the last question, something you wanted to hear about today and you didn't get a chance to hear it yet? Over there. I'll bring a mic. Here, can you pass this mic? Hi, my name is Cheryl. Um, after being home and raising my family and having a hair salon on my own, just out of my home, um, I went back to school. I'm uh, going to be graduating from Ferris University. And um, so this is my new encore. <laughs> But I don't know really how to get an internship. And I thought that, that mentioned the internship, but I'm not really sure. Um, nobody really talked about that today. So I was wondering if you had. Um, right now, business administration and management. But like I said, I'm, I really want something that, you know, into an organization that has a purpose. Yes. So I would say. Um, you know, get involved with the Grand Rapids Senior Leadership Crowd because they are plugged in to the nonprofit and kind of social purpose community here. A lot of this is very local. Um, you know, internships that exist, I, I have many, many stories of people who did internships in the book where they got internships that were designed for younger people, but they applied because an internship was available. So if you see internships available, keep in mind that you, there's no reason that you can't apply, even if an internship isn't exactly using language that is targeting someone like you. But the other way that I see people create internships is that they craft them. They negotiate them with an organization and they say, you know, I would like to get in some exposure and I'm available. Why don't you give me a chance? And in the nonprofit world particularly, it's a little easier. Um, internships in the for-profit world are heavily regulated and it's really hard for um, companies to bring on interns right now, but volunteers have a lot of language that allows them, uh, nonprofits have a lot of language that allows them to use um, volunteers, which are kind of like interns. So there's a whole lot in the book there. And I keep mentioning the book and feel it. You don't have to buy the book. It's also available in the library if you want to get it there. But there's a whole lot of information on how to craft your own internship. You're at Ferris now. I would also go to their career services class. We work with interns. My God, we have about 20 interns a year, every semester, and they're, they're crucial. We are a company that has certain regulations. They have to be a junior or senior. Unfortunately, we don't pay. They have to do it for credit. And I think if I had an intern of any age that fit the criteria, had a great attitude and wanted to learn, they could get an internship. So I would definitely utilize the university you're at because they help, that's what they're there for, to work for this you know what, the Ferris is here in Grand Rapids too. You know, and I have a lot of students from Ferris and Central and Western and State, and that's where they go to school, but their internships are here. And their counselors or their career advisors are the ones that are, where, where do you go home? Where is Grand Rapids your home? Okay. And they're working for the student. They should work for you too. I just want someone to explain to me uh, the term uh, gerontology. <laughs> Wait, I think Mike has to do that. We have a person who's an instructor of gerontology here, and I'm going to let Mike start. Very simply, gerontology is the study of the aging process. It's the study of aging, and people who study gerontology are preparing to work with an older adult population. 
Uh, and I find that a lot of the students in my program, we have a one-year gerontology certificate program at Grand Rapids Community College. A lot of my students come because they basically are making a life transition. Very often, as was mentioned by Marcy earlier, they're providing some type of caregiving to a parent, a spouse, a friend. And that kind of lights a fire in them and they see that there's value in this kind of work and they want to do something with this kind of meaning in the community. So anyone that's interested, and I know Wayne, who came up and spoke about going back to Grand Rapids Community College, he's a graduate of my gerontology certificate program just recently. So uh, this is common that students will come to this program at, at different stages in their life. You're welcome. We do need to do some wrap up, so let's thank both Eva and Marcy. They've done an incredible job. And I imagine Marcy will be around for a few minutes afterwards if there are questions. Uh, a couple of things that we need to take care of now, okay? One is you have an evaluation from when you came in today. I do want you to fill that out because I have all these committee members who've been working a long time on this event, and we need feedback, good and bad, because we also need to know what kinds of needs there are for training in the future. Related to that, a number of people earlier had raised their hands that they were looking for an encore career transition, that they were either looking to transition from a current career or into a new career because they were out of work. Um, Grand Rapids Community College is an option. We do have career counseling, uh, and we do also have a variety of different kinds of programs, like the gerontology program, but also a number of job training, uh, credit and non-credit based programming. So if you're starting your search, you can always start with Grand Rapids Community College if you're local. Check out our website, which is just www.grcc.edu, grcc.edu. Uh, and uh, the phone number for the college, if you want to talk to someone for some information about how to enroll or how to get involved, the general number is 234-4000. Uh, I'm going to, absolutely. Two other things that are follow-up to today, and these are really important. Hopefully you've gotten inspired. Some of you heard that one great way to make a transition is through volunteering because it's an opportunity to try something new, to use your skills in a new way, and to help the nonprofits in the community. We have in this community, I believe, the best group of nonprofit service providers anywhere in the country. Uh, the problem is these nonprofits, they're constantly working with a smaller and smaller shrinking budget and increasing needs in our community. They need what you have to offer, which is your skills, your expertise, your lifetime of experience. And that's what senior leadership is all about. And we have a special event tomorrow, which is free. It's held at the Grand Rapids Public Library downtown, the main branch on Library Street. Parking is free. It will be held from 10 till noon. You do not need to register to come. And we're calling it a community resource and senior volunteer fair. At this fair, we have 25 nonprofits representing a wide range of different kinds of services in the community that will be at one location at one time trying to recruit for their type of need. So it's a lot more convenient than trying to call through the phone book and figure out what's out there. Come, meet the providers. It's like an open house. You just go from table to table, learn what they do, learn what they need, and get engaged. Again, it's a great way to perhaps transition. It's a great way to get new resume items for some of you too. So it's something I highly encourage everyone to think about. Even the person who talked about internships, this is a great way to find out what's out there and get connected. So again, Grand Rapids uh, Public Library, 10 to noon tomorrow downtown, free parking at the library. The other thing, that I'm going to mention is something that we developed as a part of the West Michigan Encore Career Advisory Committee. We felt it was really important that we not develop something like this and have nothing to refer people to afterwards. So we took Marcy's advice. She developed this beautiful transition guide, group guide, um, and we are going to be implementing this guide and doing a Encore Career Transition Group, which will meet monthly. And it's going to meet on either the first or second Wednesday of the month. We have sessions, both daytime sessions um, and, and evening sessions. 
The first sessions are going to be held on November 6th from 6.30 till 8. And the, the second one is November 13th, and that will be the daytime one, 3.30 to 5 p.m. They're going to be at the Michigan Works office on, I believe, Leonard. Is that correct? All right. And right there, Karen Riggs, raise your hand. And Gene Schmucker, right there, the two of them are going to work together as leaders of this group. They're going to implement um, Marcy's work, and over the next year, they're going to hold these monthly sessions. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet on the back table if you're interested in being in one of these Encore Career Transition Groups, which I recommend to any of you in an Encore. And here's the good news. If you, if you join one of these groups, which is free, you get a free copy of Marcy's book. Free copy of Marcy's book. So you want to come to get the book, right? But also we want you to be a part of it because we need to continue this work throughout the community. Not, it can't just be today. Uh, the thing that I find sometimes disappointing is, and even after our session this morning, people came up to me and people, I understand, many of you in this room may be in this situation where you're desperate for work. I had someone approach me this morning who was about ready to lose her house. You know, and unfortunately, these are common stories in common situations, and we feel for you. And what we're trying to do at the community level, at a high level, is change the way our community thinks about Encore Careers and encourage change. It starts here, and then it trickles down to the, the direct level, which affects people who need, need to make these transitions or wish to make these transitions. So we thank you for being a part of the movement. We thank you for your patience. And as you heard today, a lot of it is, is about you are the pioneers. You are the trendsetters, right? Uh, and uh, we encourage you in your work. The last thing I'm going to say, they keep shaking the baskets in the back. This is, this is a, called a worship center. So, so we're passing the basket. Here's the deal. We have these great sponsors, and we worked hard. And putting on an event like this costs quite a bit of money. Um, so that we can do more for you and for the community. If you care to make a, a, a donation on the way out, we encourage you to do so, okay? It's totally up to you, but if you can, we'd appreciate it. We can take cash or checks made out to GRCC. If you have a checkbook, make it out to GRCC, and that will allow us to continue this work into the future, because this is not a funded mandate. This is something we're doing because we care about the community and we care about you, so if you can help, we appreciate it. And again, can we thank Eva and Marcy one more time? Thank you. Thank you. Have a safe trip in the rain, and thank you so much for coming today.